strategies to support COVID-19 response in the low middle income countries. This is, I think, um, ser series number, episode number 29, something crazy. Um, and we have a very, very, very important topic today, um, looking at the impact of COVID-19 on newborn patients and pregnant patients. So some housekeeping rules as always, please communicate with each other to 29, I've been corrected, episode number 29. Um, so in the Q&A, please feel free, in the chat box, please feel free to introduce yourselves. Again, I can't emphasize enough, as we come to an end of this seminar series, it is really important that this has been a venue for you to connect with other individuals at your institutions or within your country and to build those networks. So I look forward to hearing from all of you. Um, questions are always welcome and I think have been the strength of this series. And so please use the Q&A box. Um, I will be moderating that and we'll take the questions and answers right at the end. So without further ado, we should get going. I'm going to introduce you to our speaker today, Julia Johnson, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Neonatology. She has a PhD in clinical science and investigation. Her interests are really focused around infection prevention and control in neonates, um, and she has extensive experience working in India. So I will hand over to Julia. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today on this really important and demanded topic. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction and welcome everybody to today's seminar. Um, the title of my talk is COVID-19 Risks to Maternal and Neonatal Health. Um, I have no relevant conflicts of interest. I do receive research support from the NIH. So in today's talk, I want to review the epidemiology of COVID-19 in, in pregnancy and associated outcomes in pregnant women and neonates. I want to provide a brief overview of recommendations for management of neonates with peri perinatal COVID-19 exposure, and also uh, briefly touch upon clinical characteristics and outcomes in young infants with community onset COVID-19. And finally, I will identify some resources for data and guidelines on COVID-19 in pregnant women, neonates, and infants. Um, so first we'll be talking about maternal and neonatal outcomes um, around um, perinatal COVID-19 and I'll be reviewing the literature um, that's available. Um, so just a little background um, with regard to um, similar beta coronaviruses, SARS and MERS-CoV um, both have limited data in pregnancy um, and what's available does suggest that the overall case fatality rate is about 25% um, for both um, and uh, maternal outcomes um, uh, included mechanical ventilation that was three times more likely among pregnant women than in non-pregnant women for SARS and complications described included miscarriages um, and preterm delivery. Uh, for MERS, um, there were only 13 case reports on pregnancy and two were associated with fetal demise and two with preterm delivery, but there was no documented vertical transmission for SARS or MERS. And so that leaves us with a lot of questions in thinking about um, COVID-19. Um, so some of the questions that have come up, and some of these are partially answered, and, and many of these are still unknown, include what the prevalence of COVID-19 is among pregnant women, whether pregnant women are at increased risk of infection compared to non-pregnant adults, what is the case fatality rate, um, what is the risk of early pregnancy infection, um, and what's the risk of vertical transmission. Additionally, um, after birth, what's the postnatal transmission risk for mother to baby in absence of separation, in absence of use of um, personal protective equipment and distancing, and does maternal symptom severity matter? Additionally, is breast milk infectious, um, and what's the spectrum of clinical disease among infected neonates? Um, so the data I'll review today will address some of these questions, but not all, and um, we all continue to have a lot to learn about this topic. Um, so my group conducted a literature review of studies published um, through the early phase of the pandemic um, through May 15th on COVID-19 and pregnancy and maternal and neonatal outcomes, and I'll review some of those data um, and then just briefly mention a couple of studies that were published after that cutoff date. Um, interesting outcomes that we were looking into for mothers included um, trimester presentation, um, clinical presentation, any associated adverse pregnancy outcomes, and then ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, and death. And for neonates, we were interested in gestational age at birth, 
um, mode of delivery, um, whether neonates were separated from mothers, uh, whether they required NICU admission, and whether they were breastfed. Um, additionally, what was the clinical course and what were um, associated laboratory parameters and SARS-CoV-2 PCR testing results. In that time period, um, we identified 99 studies that were published, um, which cumulatively reported 705 women with laboratory confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection. We chose to um, hone in on laboratory confirmed cases to avoid any overlap with um, clinical diseases that might have a similar presentation. Um, and so we excluded studies that either grouped laboratory confirmed or clinically diagnosed women or only reported on clinically diagnosed women. Um, overall, these studies reported 520 neonates with perinatal exposure and the bulk of the publications um, were from China, which um, makes sense in the early stages of the pandemic. In terms of epidemiology, um, there were actually very few studies that provided population-based estimates of prevalence, um, and there was heavy reliance on case reports and case series, um, especially during the first couple of months. Um, but we did have some helpful data. So in the Lombardy region of Italy, which obviously um, was quite affected, um, they reported that there were 42 pregnant women over a three-week period. I believe that was in March. Um, and that represented um, about 0.6% of deliveries that occurred in the region at the time. But it's worth noting that these women were all diagnosed um, after symptom-based testing. In New York City, um, there were two academic centers that instituted universal testing. And um, over a two-week period after implementing that change, they reported a 15.4% prevalence among women admitted to labor and delivery. And then in a London maternity hospital, after implementation of universal testing, they reported a 7% prevalence. For uh, women um, who were diagnosed with um, COVID-19, um, presentation ranged from asymptomatic to critically ill. Um, and the concern for asymptomatic presentation was raised by Breslin et al. So that's a study out of New York. Um, they initially um, published a case series of seven women, two of whom were asymptomatic on labor and delivery admission. Uh, one woman had intrapartum onset of symptoms and the other postpartum, and both became critically ill, requiring ICU admission. Um, and so they subsequently implemented universal testing at those centers. Um, Sutton et al. then reported that among women who uh, presented to LD and tested positive for COVID 19 after implementation of universal testing, that almost 90% of the women who tested positive were initially asymptomatic, although 10% of that group ultimately um, developed a fever over the course of their labor and delivery admission. And obviously this raises a significant concern because um, women who ultimately either remain asymptomatic or become symptomatic over the course of their L&D admission, but are not known to have COVID-19, potentially expose many healthcare workers um, and also uh, potentially appropriate precautions are not taken to reduce transmission risk to the neonate. Um, this table is a summary of maternal clinical presentation. Um, so the bulk of the published reports in our review um, occurred during the third trimester of pregnancy, um, so 92%. And among uh, women uh, for whom these data were available, 15% required ICU admission, 12% mechanical ventilation, and overall, there were 11 reported maternal deaths in our um, review. Among uh, women for whom a pregnancy outcome was described, so that was 615 women of the 705, 83% had a live birth. Um, there were five pregnancies that ended in stillbirth, accounting for six um, neonates. One was a, a twin pregnancy. Um, and then uh, there were also some described um, induced and spontaneous abortions, and 13% of women remained pregnant. Um, at the time of publication. Um, 448 women had a reported mode of delivery and the vast majority were delivered by C-section. Um, that I would say is heavily influenced by early data from China where um, all, nearly all women um, diagnosed with COVID-19 regardless of symptom severity were initially delivered by C-section. So I think um, looking at data now that rate would go down significantly. 19% um, of delivered women were specifically reported as being delivered um, due to their respiratory status or severity of COVID. Um, and then 11% um, of, uh, of pregnancies were um, reported to be complicated by decreased fetal movement or non-reassuring fetal heart tracing. Um, that's to say that that number could potentially be higher, but some studies did not have that level of detail um, for the reported cases. 
percent of delivered um, pregnancies were preterm, um, and um, there was limited reporting on ultimate pregnancy outcome among women who remained pregnant. Uh, so moving on to neonatal outcomes, um, specifically we'll start with SARS-CoV-2 PCR testing results. Um, so this is uh, for a total of 520 women, or neonates, I'm sorry. Um, it's uh, worth noting that only 387 of those 520 neonates had reported testing, so there's a lot of unknowns here. But among those 387 neonates with reported testing, 21 or 5% did have at least one positive SARS-CoV-2 sample um, while they were admitted um, in the hospital. Um, and the bulk of those samples were either nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal. Um, there were um, uh, over 150 samples where there was no reported testing site and presumptively most of those were likely also NP or OP swabs. Um, but there were additional tests um, obtained from other sites, um, mostly in combination with respiratory samples. So for example, anal and rectal swabs were among the more common um, reported um, testing sites with 38 samples and four of those were positive or 11%. Um, and there were no reported um, positives from either urine or CSF um, and only one reported positive from neonatal blood. Um, and then samples um, obtained around the time of delivery from either mom or um, products of conception um, there was only one reported cord blood sample that was positive, similarly with amniotic fluid. Um, there were five um, positive placental samples and then um, no uh, positives for maternal urine or blood. Um, and then among 23 samples tested uh, of breast milk, only two were positive or 9%. Um, I know that's uh, been uh, focus on in the media and in journals a fair bit. So what the role is of serologic testing or IgM and IgG testing in neonates. And among the studies that we looked at, there were um, really only a few studies that did any serologic testing in neonates. And two studies did report cumulatively three neonates with elevated IgM despite negative um, PCR testing. But it's worth noting that all three neonates had a mild elevation with rapid decline. Um, and one of these studies was published with an accompanying um, editorial that, that did appropriately raise the concern that serologic diagnosis of congenital viral infection is complicated by high rates of false positive testing. And they thought that because of the overall relatively mild elevation of IgM with a rapid decline, that these were um, possibly false positive. Um, and then I did want to briefly mention a couple of highlights from this table. Uh, these slides will be made available to you, and I don't have time to go through all these parameters, but we did want to look at a variety of um, uh, clinical characteristics in neonates. And these, um, this table is separated out by neonates with positive PCR testing and neonates without positive testing, which could include um, neonates with negative testing, as well as those who did, had no reported testing. Um, and there are just a couple of things I wanted to point out. So um, overall, um, neonates born to mothers with critical illness, um, so ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, associated maternal death, were more likely to test positive, um, with 28% of neonates with positive PCR testing having mothers um, with critical illness. Um, additionally, um, they were overall less likely to be separated from mother after delivery, more likely to be breastfed, um, and ultimately more likely to require a NICU admission. Um, and I'll go over this in a little bit more detail, but um, some of these neonates with positive PCR testing likely had postnatal transmission events, and, and some most definitely did based on um, post-delivery diagnosis in mothers um, with exposure prior to knowing mother's um, illness. And then the most common symptoms among um, neonates were um, respiratory distress and fever. Um, those were described in both groups, but at a significantly higher rate in neonates with positive testing and abnormal chest imaging, although not obtained in very many patients. Um, so 85% of neonates that had described chest imaging among those with positive testing um, were abnormal. Um, and um, there were no deaths among the neonates who tested positive, and there were six described in the um, group with, um, without positive um, testing. Um, so going through this in a little bit more detail, um, one of the things that's come up is that there's significant variability in timing of neonatal testing, which obviously can affect results. And so in the group um, of 21 neonates with positive testing, the age of first positive test ranged from zero to eight days. This was all during initial hospital admission, so we didn't include any positive neonates that had already been discharged from the hospital. But the bulk of these were obtained on day of birth through two days of age. 
Um, among these um, infants, uh, three were reported as asymptomatic. One, there was no description of the clinical course. Um, and um, there were um, other complicating factors that could account for a neonate's clinical presentation, including prematurity and um, uh, bacterial infection at the same time. Um, there was one neonate described with um, asphyxia and one presented with true encephalitic um, symptoms. And then there was one case that really provided the most compelling evidence for likely in utero transmission um, reported by Kurtzman et al. And that was a, a neonate born in Canada. Um, and they reported just more extensive testing than a lot of the other um, studies that we reviewed. And um, in this particular case, um, there was positive PCR testing from placental swabs, both from the maternal and fetal side, placental tissue, and then from the neonate, um, from the nasopharynx on day of life zero, two, and seven, uh, from the blood day four, and from stool day seven. And among these 21 neonates, um, there was possible postnatal transmission reported in five cases. In four, the mother was diagnosed after delivery, and um, one was reported to be possible nosocomial transmission, although there's not um, uh, sufficient uh, data in the um, study to support that. Um, and again, there were no deaths reported in this group, but final disposition was not reported in several of these cases. Um, as I mentioned, there were six neonatal deaths. Um, five of these were in the setting of maternal critical illness. And I think that's really worth pointing out that um, the bulk of poor neonatal outcomes were in the setting of significant maternal symptoms, especially respiratory failure with um, associated hypoxia, which would impact um, any um, fetus or neonate. Um, all uh, six neonates who died were preterm, um, uh, and then none had positive testing, although not all of them had any testing. So one of these neonates died at about two hours of life, um, and so no testing was obtained. The length of stay in this group was variable, and in some cases, especially in China, was driven by persistently positive testing rather than ongoing symptoms. Um, so in some cases, repeated stool samples were obtained, and as long as the neonate was positive, was kept in isolation in the hospital, and obviously that management is highly variable um, in different countries and different hospitals. Um, and there was limited reporting on post-discharge post follow-up. Um, we do know that two neonates um, tested positive as outpatients, and both were asymptomatic and were thought to be due to postnatal transmission in the home um, in the setting of a mother who continued to be symptomatic. So in summary, um, maternal clinical presentation uh, ranges from asymptomatic to critical illness. The case fatality rate, at least uh, from what we know so far, does appear to be significantly lower than what's described with SARS and MERS. And neonatal infection is seen in about 5% of neonates with reported testing, um, which likely represents a mix of vertical and horizontal transmission. Breast milk rarely tests positive, um, and there were no documented transmission events related to use of breast milk. Um, and the most common symptom in exposed neonates is respiratory distress, regardless of testing results. There are obviously some limitations to this review of the literature, including the preponderance of case reports, which allows for a limited understanding of epidemiology, including prevalence of disease. Um, and the level of detail in the studies that were included was um, highly variable, especially with regard to reporting of clinical course, and then also with the extent of workup of exposed neonates. So many either had no reported testing or had a single swab on day of birth with no follow-up, um, which is um, a little bit more difficult um, to know exactly what the rate of neonatal infection is. Um, and again, very few studies with post-discharge follow-up. So I understand that these data were cut off at May 15th, and we've had many um, uh, publications since that time, including several cohort studies, which are um, more helpful in understanding epidemiology of disease. I did want to highlight um, two studies that have been published since that time. Um, so the first was really um, a robust um, population-based cohort study coming out of the United Kingdom using a national surveillance system. And um, over the study period, they described 427 pregnant women admitted with SARS-CoV-2 and um, based on their data um, related to pregnant women being admitted and how many pregnancies there were in the UK at the time, the rate was 4.9 per thousand pregnancies. And among those women who were admitted, 10% required respiratory support and there were five maternal deaths. Um, now they grouped the, these data, um, so 266 or 62% of women delivered or had a pregnancy loss. The bulk of these women delivered um, and did not have a pregnancy loss, but um, that's how the, the data were um, grouped. Um, and then 196 of uh, women who delivered um, gave birth at term 
In that whole group, there were 12 neonates who had positive PCR testing. There were no detailed data available on these neonates. They did, however, describe that, that half had positive testing within the first 12 hours and the other half had testing that was positive after 12 hours. But there's no information on how many samples were obtained, what the source of the samples um, was, and whether any products of conception were tested. Um, this study is notable for a high proportion of Black and other uh, minority ethnic groups in the cohort, um, so overrepresented um, in terms of the population of the United Kingdom in that it was 56% of the cohort. Um, and the authors didn't really have a great um, explanation for that and thought it was um, worth uh, further study. And so they pointed to some opportunities um, for improvement and access to care, but that, you know, with a, a national health system um, like the United Kingdom has, um, they thought that was less likely to play a significant role than in some other settings. And then I wanted to um, just point out um, another case of likely in utero transmission that had some of the most robust evidence um, based to support that. Um, this was a mother who was infected five days um, prior to delivery. Um, and ultimately had a vaginal delivery at 34 weeks. Um, the neonate was separated from the mother at birth um, and presented with respiratory distress and fever. Um, this uh, neonate did require respiratory support, but did well and was able to wean off um, support by day of life five and ultimately was discharged at 21 days of life. Um, but the testing for this particular case was um, um, compelling in that um, neonatal testing was positive at 24 hours, 48 hours, and 14 days. Um, they also had an extensive evaluation for other bacterial and viral causes of fever. Um, and then the placental pathology was notable for um, bilitis as well as immunohistochemistry um, uh, demonstrating um, cytoplasmic staining and syncytial um, and that's really been a theme of, of several recent publications, is that placental pathology does um, show abnormalities, um, in some cases even in the absence of positive um, neonatal testing. And so that's something that continues to be investigated. Um, so briefly, I just wanted to mention a, a couple of summary thoughts based on review of the literature and also um, guidelines published by various groups, including the WHO and um, in the United States, the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, so mode of delivery should be determined by obstetric indications. So C-section is not indicated to reduce risk of transmission, um, and that's been a shift um, from what was being done in the early stages of the pandemic in China. Um, infection prevention strategies um, should be used to reduce um, transmission risk during labor and delivery, and obviously this is in some cases resource dependent, um, but if possible in a negative pressure room with appropriate use of PPE. Um, there's no contraindication for delayed cord clamping, um, so the thought uh, is that the additional risk um, uh, through delayed cord clamping is negligible and that the benefit to neonate outweighs any risks. Um, and then recommendations regarding post-delivery practices are, are variable and partially resource-driven. Um, the WHO um, from the beginning really recommended against separation of mother and neonate encouraged breastfeeding with appropriate precautions, including mask use and hand hygiene by the mother. Um, in the United States, initially, the AAP um, did recommend for temporary separation of mom and neonate, and that was um, due to a lot of unknowns, um, but those um, guidelines have been updated as of July 22nd to no longer recommend tempor temporary separation unless it's medically necessary. Either mother is too ill to care for the neonate or the neonate is symptomatic. Um, they do continue to recommend PCR testing from nasopharynx and oropharynx in neonates at 24 and 48 hours. So I wanted to shift gears a little bit and briefly touch upon community onset COVID-19 in young infants. Um, we also reviewed um, the literature um, in this age group. Um, over um, the course of the pandemic um, through June 15th, um, we identified 38 studies that reported cumulatively 63 infants. Again, as a preponderance of case reports and case series, there was one cohort study um, in this set. Um, the age range was five days to less than three months. A lot of the studies were not that specific in terms of the age of the infant, only reporting in, in whole months, um, but um, all infants that we included were less than three months of age. Um, there was a significant male predominance, which um, caught my eye um, with 69% of included infants being male, and that mirrors what was described in some studies in older age groups, so not all. Um, and again, with, with this being case reports, it's uncertain whether this hold, would hold true in a population-based study, um, but something worth noting. Um, among this group of 63 infants, eight were reported to have significant prior medical history, including extreme prematurity, congenital heart disease, and renal anomalies. 
the infant with cystic fibrosis um, was actually asymptomatic and only tested due to a family exposure. The uh, majority of these infants did have reported contact with symptomatic or COVID-confirmed individuals, um, most of whom were family members. Um, and the most common symptoms reported were um, fever and uh, respiratory symptoms, as well as issues with feeding and gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, the unusual presentations in this group that um, I would be um, curious to see if they would continue to show up um, in larger data sets um, included apnea, and apnea is a common neonatal presentation um, with other respiratory viral pathogens, including rhinovirus, so perhaps not surprising, but also there were um, two infants who were reported to have new onset seizures, and then there were three infants who had elevated cardiac enzymes um, uh, with uh, presumptive myocarditis. And then three neonates in this group were asymptomatic. Laboratory abnormalities included um, neutropenia, lymphopenia, and thrombocytopenia, um, and then elevated inflammatory markers, including serapine, procalcitonin, and elevated amino transferases were also reported, although overall a limited number of infants um, in this review had this type of testing. Among those um, infants with chest imaging, 46% um, had an abnormal chest x-ray, and 100% of neonates or infants um, with a chest CT had an abnormal um, CT, although probably a little bit biased because not every infant received an image. And so those who had imaging, especially a chest CT, were more likely obviously to be ill and have respiratory symptoms. Co-infection with another respiratory valve pathogen um, such as RSE was described in five or 8%. Um, and then in terms of testing um, sites, again, most of these um, infants had positive respiratory specimens, but positives were also described from other sources, um, including actually in CSF in one infant, blood in one, and urine in one. Um, there was one study that was quite interesting because it um, reported serial quantitative PCR testing in infants, and this infant had NPOP saliva, blood, urine, and stool samples that all had detectable viral load um, that gradually declined over the course of a three-week hospital admission. And this was actually paired with maternal testing, and the viral load in the infant was significantly higher than in the mother. Um, the clinical course of these um, infants was largely good. 92% were admitted to the hospital, though I would say that actually included some asymptomatic and very mild cases, and that was largely because of the unknown clinical course of this disease in this age group, and also because um, infants presenting with fever warrant uh, evaluation for bacterial and other viral etiologies of disease and are likely to get systemic antibiotics. 21% were admitted to ICU. Again, I think partially by age group, some of these infants are admitted to the NICU, not necessarily because they have ICU needs, um, but because of age. 22% um, did require some um, uh, nasal cannula support, but a, only a very small number required either um, non-invasive or invasive positive pressure ventilation. Um, only one infant required pressors. Um, out of uh, infants for whom this was reported, 64% um, required systemic antibiotics. And then 14% were given COVID-specific treatment, so including um, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. But this really seemed to be driven partially by um, timing uh, of when in the pandemic these cases occurred and also um, what country and what institution. So this was not overall um, standard of care and, and there wasn't a specific pattern on what type of infant would get these medications. Um, overall length of stay, um, the median was three days. So again, kind of time to do the evaluation for possible um, bacterial sepsis, um, but extended up um, over um, a longer period of time for more ill infants. And then none of these infants died. Um, they all improved with uh, supportive care. Um, so similar to um, other age groups, the spectrum of clinical disease ranges from asymptomatic to critical illness, but most infants did have mild to moderate disease and recovered quickly. Um, the symptoms are nonspecific, and that's why they weren't a high index of suspicion, especially in the um, clinic and pediatric emergency room. Um, and you do have to evaluate for other etiologies. You'd hate to miss um, either co-infection or um, the symptom um, presentation being um, caused by another disease altogether and not COVID. And then neurologic and cardiac manifestations are overall rare but noteworthy, and they do mirror symptoms seen in older age groups. Uh, limitations, again, reliance on case reports, variable evaluation of neonates, and very limited post-discharge follow-up. And then finally, I just wanted to highlight a couple of resources that I found helpful over the course of this pandemic. Um, and so uh, one of the great um, 
things that's available is basically a, a lit COVID, which is through um, PubMed and is a curated um, list of uh, publications. Um, it does take a little bit longer to index than, than PubMed itself. And so sometimes it can be a couple of days behind, but it's been a really great resource. Um, also individual journal websites typically have a section for COVID collections and they're usually not behind paywall. So even if your institution doesn't have a subscription, you're able to access publications on COVID. Um, there are also a couple of helpful websites that offer a brief review and synthesis of published literature. Um, one, um, actually both are from the UK. One is called Don't Forget the Bubbles and it's um, neonatal and pediatric literature. And then um, there is an OBGYN in the UK, um, uh, uh, Dr. Thornton, who uh, maintains an updated list of maternal and neonatal um, publications. And he also is very thorough in um, reviewing possible duplicate publications, which has been an issue, especially in the early stages of the pandemic. Um, now there are increasing numbers of registries for COVID in pregnancy, and here's just a few, including the International COVID Preg Registry. Um, and I'm sure there are many others, um, but those were some of the earliest um, to be established. Um, UCAS, again, is the one um, that was responsible for that cohort study I mentioned. And then um, uh, updated guidelines um, for COVID-19 are available on the websites um, of the WHO, CDC, and American Academy of Pediatrics, including many other um, national, regional, and international bodies. And then I did include all of the references for both um, literature reviews in case you were interested in um, reviewing any of these studies further. Um, so I thank you for your time and I welcome any questions. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, I really appreciate your thorough review of the data. I think a lot of our questions today are going to be focused on some of the implementation of what you're seeing in your opinions um, to the settings Welcome to the cat. Yeah, he's a regular Zoom bomber. This is Sam. <laughs> My three-year-old is also a regular Zoom bomber. Um, so a lot of the questions we have are focused around implementation and how do you apply this data to guide policies or programs in low resource settings? Um, so I'll start off with Praneep Chatterjee who asks, you know, what is the risk of transmission of the infection, and I know this is a difficult question to answer, from the neonate to the other family members, especially in low middle income countries where you have multiple generations of families living under one roof, there is a concern about transmission to elderly parent, grandparents or contacts. And do you recommend that all children who are, test, who are born to a, a known COVID positive mom should be tested for SARS-CoV regardless, regard, regardless of their symptomatology. Yeah, so I, th I think, again, there's some unknowns here. I would say that in general, we know that neonates are a lot uh, less capable of um, aerosolizing their, um, their respiratory secretions. And so I think overall transmission risk from a neonate to either healthcare workers or um, family members in the home is lower than in other age groups. I don't think anyone can say that the risk is zero, um, but again, um, probably overall less likely to, for example, cough and then to have a cough that generates adequate droplets to really be a transmission risk. But I would think that any um, family member who is in close proximity to the neonate and involved in things like changing diapers, we don't really know what the role of, um, for example, continued shedding of virus in stool is, and so any diapered children that, that might potentially play a risk. So I would say that, um, you know, as far as is possible, like protecting um, vulnerable individuals in the family, and um, again, distancing is, is powerful, so if it's possible to distance within the home or maybe not involve those um, um, those members of the family and things like diaper changes, or um, I wouldn't suggest, for example, kissing the baby in the face, and, you know, things like that, um, probably for the protection of both parties, actually, which I know can be hard, especially for grandparents. But um, again, I think there's a lot of unknowns, but overall, I would think that neonates are less capable of being infectious than, than older age groups. Um, and then the other question was related to testing. Um, if it's possible, I, I know obviously testing um, uh, resources are limited, um, but we do recommend testing of neonates regardless of 
symptomatology, understanding that a lot of infected individuals are asymptomatic or become symptomatic after the timing of testing. Um, and I think it would be helpful to understand what the true neonatal infection rate is um, as far as is possible to standardize the timing of testing and the site for your institution. I'm not saying that the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, recommendation is appropriate for every setting. Um, and even in our case, so they recommended getting um, separate samples from the nasopharynx and oropharynx, but also gave the caveat that if you have limited resources that you can do a combined NP and OP sample to reduce resources required for testing. And then um, as far as testing at 24 hours and 48 hours, that if the neonate was being discharged home before 48 hours, that it wasn't necessary to do that second sample. So even in our setting, you know, we, this is a limited resource. And so, you know, as long as I think you're consistent and, and have the capacity to implement what you're proposing, it would be ideal to test neonates, but I understand not always feasible. Great, thank you so much. Um, the second question is kind of close to my heart as most of the viewers on this um, series will know. So have there been any studies of women who have tested positive in their first or second trimester for SARS-CoV, um, which then look at neonatal outcomes or abnormalities post-delivery? Yeah, so I think, um, so over the studies we reviewed for our list, there were only very few um, infections reported in first and second trimester. And in a lot of those studies, it just said women remain pregnant at the end of the study. There were a couple of studies that reported healthy deliveries after um, first trimester or second trimester infections, so several weeks out. Um, however, I think there are a lot of groups that are interested in studying this more systematically. So one example, um, there's an ongoing um, cohort study led by um, uh, Irina Bird, who's a maternal fetal medicine physician at Hopkins, and Bob Yokin, um, who's a virologist, um, looking at um, women who have serologic evidence of um, COVID-19, even if their PCR testing at time of labor and delivery um, is negative, so perhaps indicating um, previous infection during pregnancy, and then following uh, them and their neonates forward after delivery and also doing serologic testing in the neonate. And so I think that will be helpful. Um, I think they're planning on enrolling around um, 500 pregnant women to, to study that further. And I know there are a lot of groups looking at similar questions. Uh, so I think partially unanswered, again, heavily relying on case reports. And um, many case reports are uh, targeting true peri-delivery COVID-19 rather than infection earlier in pregnancy. And so there's a little bit of lag in information. I think this is really where some of the national registries can be helpful. Although I will say that the um, registry through the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is focused on neonates, only is um, including neonates whose, mother whose mothers tested positive within 14 days of delivery, so also not answering that question. Um, but there are similar registries for um, women who are infected in pregnancy that are following them forward. And, and some of those registries are um, offering uh, kind of rolling data. So if you go to individual registry websites, um, especially if one exists for your country, there will be some data um, to help guide answering that question as well. But I think still to be determined. And I think with some of these adverse pregnancy outcomes, unless, unless you're looking at population data, it's impossible to tell, like miscarriages happen and um, stillbirths do happen, but, you know, does it, is there an increased incidence once you're looking at population level data? I don't think we know yet. Thank you so much. I just have to watch this space. Um, Anita Shet asks you, you know, thank you for a comprehensive and informative presentation. It appears that SARS-CoV-2 continues to paradoxically be less severe in infants compared to other respiratory viruses. Is this your impression also and with the review and are there any plausible hypotheses to explain this phenomenon? Um, I'm not sure it's overall necessarily less severe than other respiratory viruses. I, you know, I think, um, I mean, I, I don't work as a general pediatrician anymore, but over the course of training, I mean, certainly not every child who gets rhinovirus or metanumovirus or flu requires admission to the hospital or any sort of support. Many are able to recover at home when many we probably never know are positive. And so I think there's a, a big spectrum of disease. Um, I think what we can tell from the early cohort is that 
if you have significant underlying past medical history, it is going to increase your risk. So the most severe case in that review was um, a neonate with a history of extreme prematurity, I believe at 27 weeks. And that's the only neonate that required high frequency um, oscillator um, ventilation over the course of admission related to COVID-19. There was one other infant who had been previously healthy who required ICU admission and ventilation um, and had a course complicated by pneumothorax and chest tube insertion. Um, and so there are these critically, in, critically ill infants, but it is the minority of cases. And it seems to be kind of difficult to predict who is going to get sick versus stay asymptomatic or mild. So in the absence of universal testing, I don't think we fully know. Um, yeah, and I think that same thing exists with adults too. You know, some of the patients who have been on ECMO and severely ill have been young with no comorbidities. Right. Um, another hypothesis question. There seems to be a male predominance in the infant studies that you presented. Um, where did these reports come from geographically? And then again, is there any way to explain this phenomenon? Um, so I also was interested in seeing if it was a trend just from a particular country. Was there, a, a, were people more likely to report male infants or was there a higher proportion of the population that was male? But it was such a striking predominance at 69% and that actually included studies from the United States um, and case series where both um, uh, sexes were reported. So I think there was a case series of six infants and five were male. So it was kind of regardless of what country it was from, um, there, there did seem to be this, this male predominance. And so I don't have a great explanation for that. I don't know if anybody else on the call might. Um, I know there are obviously other diseases that show a male predominance. Um, and in terms of other studies reporting a male predominance in COVID-19 and other age groups, there are some that do in larger cohort studies. I think there was a, a an adult cohort study from China that reported a male predominance, but on the converse, there's also a cohort study reporting a female predominance. So I don't quite know what to make of it. And I, again, I don't know if it would hold true in a larger study, um, but 69% in, in 63 infants seemed uh, noteworthy. So I don't, I don't know for sure, but interesting to continue following data. Um, a quick question for you. What is the treatment regimen for neonates for COVID-19? Um, is it the same as adults? There is no um, recommendation to use any COVID-specific therapy for um, neonates, so it really is just supportive care. Um, and a lot of the um, medications that are used in older age group uh, have either no data in, in children at all, or especially in neonates, or have concerning side effects. Um, and so um, I would recommend supportive care. Um, I think if it's part of uh, you know, a study that's investigating um, potential treatment in high-risk groups, so I know there's a study um, looking at um, children of any age with pre-existing chronic lung disease, including neonates, and, and looking at whether uh, convalescent plasma has any role in that group, um, but I don't think we have any data to support widespread use of, of any um, uh, COVID-specific treatment in neonates. And again, uh, the majority of neonates who tested positive um, did well and required um, maybe IV fluids or some respiratory support, if anything, um, but recovered within a few days. So I think supportive care is really the focus. And then a couple more questions. Um, sorry. So I'm not sure that we even know the answer to this, but what is the maternal mortality rate and the perinatal mortality rate among COVID deaths in the US? Um, so the CDC published updated um, uh, information on COVID and pregnancy just recently. And I, I do know that in that report, they said that pregnant women appear to be more likely to require ICU admission and I think mechanical ventilation than non-pregnant adult women. Um, I don't off the top of my head know the mortality reported in that group. Um, and at least in the, um, in the studies that we reviewed, again, there were no neonatal deaths in those who tested positive. Um, and I don't think we have national level data for that yet, at least not that I'm aware of. Yeah, no, I think you're right there. Um, and do you know if there's any data for pluripartum pregnancies? So multiple pregnancies, are they do they have a higher morbidity and mortality? Um, 
so overall, there weren't that many pregnancies that included multiples. All of them were twins. There were no triplet or higher order of multiple pregnancies reported. Um, I, I did kind of anecdotally, I guess, notice that um, there were there was a case series out of Iran that reported nine women who were critically ill with, um, with COVID-19. And I believe it was five women who died in that case series or maybe even more, but there were more multiples in that case series and they were more likely to have um, stillbirths or uh, early neonatal death in twins. But again, that's a case series and I don't know how that would, um, how that would um, look in a larger population. But overall, not many pregnancies with multiples reported. Um, so tough to answer at this point. Sure. Um, and then one question from our chat box. Do we know the reason for testing of the asymptomatic plus newborns? Um, question mark, assume plus household contact question mark. Paul, if you want to unblock yourself um, and want to ask this question, um, feel free to. Um, but I think the question really is that should we be doing asymptomatic testing in mothers during delivery and newborns? Um, so for women being admitted to labor and delivery, uh, we've moved towards universal testing. And I believe we started doing so um, in early April. And again, this kind of came from those early reports of women who initially um, presented asymptomatic became symptomatic in the hospital and thus exposed a number of healthcare workers. Um, and also it was difficult to anticipate what their medical needs would be. And so if it's within um, the realm of possibility for your institution, I, I do think it's a positive thing. It allows you to make better decisions in terms of how to um, isolate or cohort um, uh, women and how to assign staff and how to minimize risk of transmission within the hospital. Um, so again, with uh, nearly 90% in one study of women who tested positive being asymptomatic, I, this is a, a real risk um, that is likely um, true everywhere. Um, for the neonates, um, I think, again, um, partially it's to help guide um, anticipatory guidance in terms of like, are we expecting this neonate to potentially get sicker, even if they're asymptomatic now and, um, you know, making decisions regarding potential hospital discharge um, and guiding any sort of follow-up. Um, but uh, especially with neonates with perinatal exposure, um, if you want to answer the question of, of uh, risk of vertical transmission, then having that early sample is important and not waiting until the neonate potentially gets symptomatic on day of life five. And then you don't know whether it was nosocomial or vertical transmission. Um, in terms of the um, infants who were asymptomatic, um, but were community onset um, disease. Uh, so at least one was tested because of a, a contact with an uncle who tested positive, and that was the patient with CF. And the reason that was done is because that child was thought to be higher risk of getting sick with COVID-19. Ultimately, he never de developed symptoms, which was fortunate. Um, and then a couple of the others, I think, were part of mother-baby pairs where their mother was symptomatic and came to the hospital. They tested the infant. They were positive. They admitted them together. Um, and um, you know, watched basically for any development of symptoms and there weren't any, which is great. Um, but yeah, I think, I... yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, finish your thought, please. Yeah, I think in general, you know, some of it's driven by contact tracing and, and also thinking that these children might be potentially at higher risk of having complications, although we're not sure yet if that will pan out. Yeah, and I think that, you know, at our institutional level now, I believe we're testing all patients are admitted into the hospital and it's really to protect our healthcare right. workforce. And so yeah, and I think patients for testing are slightly different there. For sure. And I think especially in neonates and infants, it can be so difficult to decide what constitutes a symptom of COVID-19. And, you know, if you have isolated poor feeding, that could be almost anything. And so initially there was testing only for fever and then, you know, it, it just gradually expanded. And so it just ended up making sense to test everyone um, to protect us. Well, Juliet, thank you so much. This was a really great presentation and extremely informative. But I feel like that's gonna, we're gonna have to bring you back at some point because we're still waiting for a lot more data to come out um, as some of these longitudinal cohort studies complete. Um, Julia also wins the award for being literally the only presenter that stuck to 20 minutes-ish.
um, which has never happened in our 29 episodes during the COVID-19 strategies seminar. Um, well, hopefully, I think we're having our last session next week. I'm gonna ask Megan in the chat just to remind us what that session is. Um, and we look forward to like having all of you engage um, a couple more times before we call, um, call bring the series to an end. Um, just for everybody who's listening, we do feel like this community has helped. Um, a lot of us connect with partners and colleagues abroad um, and we really want to maybe shift gears a little bit to looking at COVID-19 and beyond. So, you know, watch the space, but then reach out to us if you have suggestions or things that you have not heard about that you're curious about or you would like us to cover and reach out to our experts across the institution. Um, next week will be a, a Center on Communication um, by Catherine Bertram from JHU CCP. So, I look forward to seeing you all next Thursday. Julia, thank you once again for a great presentation. Um, slides and um, all the references that were presented will be made available on our website later on this week. And as per timing, my daughter has come to Gate Crash, have a Zoom session <laughs> right at the end. So I will say goodbye. Have a good day, everybody.